Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Kings 18. Right now, if you'd add your blessings on the reading of the word, or give us instructions and strength to do this message in Jesus' name. Amen. We can read the rest of that chapter if you'd like to. But this morning, I want, I want to finish a message that I began last week. I've never preached a message and then come back and, and, and was going to finish it and had as many young people as we have come to me and say, Brother Roger, will you please finish this message? And so I am. It's not going to be very lengthy, but I'm going to finish it for them, the Lord being my helper. I, want, I told you I want to preach on the subject disturbing the peace. I've been preaching a series of messages for a while on the life of Elijah and Elisha. These were men who experienced the power of God on their lives on a daily basis. I told you when I preached this that I believed in the days in which we live, we need some men and women of God who have upon their lives the spirit and the authority and the anointing of Elijah and Elisha. I think we struggle today as Christians over whether or not we should be disturbers of the peace. Because the Lord does say that blessed are the peacemakers. The Bible teaches the meek shall inherit the earth. And so sometimes we are kind of neutral. And we are neutralized by fear of offending people. And then we're also neutralized when it comes to standing up for God because we get discouraged. Many times when we share our faith with someone, they have not really been accepted or receptive. It discourages. I mean, should we as believers disturb the peace? Should we upset the status quo? 
Should we make the ungodly feel uncomfortable? Well, folks, the thing that I've learned from the Bible is a fix. And you can't get saved until you are offended. In fact, it's like salt in an open wound. And you will never be converted unless you have experienced Holy Ghost conviction. And, and so I ask, should, should we just stay in these walls and behave ourselves and not be a disturber of the peace? And I say no. I'm telling you folks that we're living in a day when this book needs to be preached like it has never been preached Amen. before. Amen. We need some folks telling people what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. Yes. And I pray God raises up a generation like these young people to say what is right and to say what is wrong. And so I, I wanted to preach on this, and I did. And some of the kids took notes. Now let me give you just a few notes so you'll be up with it. I told you if we were to be a disturber of the peace, we had to have three things. Number one, we need to be trained. You must understand that if you're going to be an influence for God, you just don't wake up one morning and head out without any training and become an influence for God. Everybody, you watch them, who accomplishes a great task for God, they have some training. Now, I'm not talking about college. I'm not even talking about uh, some of the seminary. But I'm telling you that if you're going to be a disturber of the peace, that you're going to have to go to school in the, uh, in the things that God, let me get it out, would have you to know. I'm afraid sometimes many people depend too much on education. And if you'll study Elijah, he didn't go to the seminary. He went to the seminary of hard knocks. So Elijah at this time has been in school for three years. You say, preacher, what school? Well, it was on the back side of the desert. He was a prophet of God. He'd been praying for six months. And God just turned the water off in the land where he was living. I mean, it was dry. It was so dry uh, that the cattle and the animals was beginning to die. There was no water for anything, and their crops were drying up. Now, Ahab was the king, and Jezebel was his wife. And if you go back, you'll find for three years that Elijah has promised and prophesied that there would be no rain in it. And there was I mean, there's no water for anything. Because I believe God was sick and tired of the way they were living. And do. And so God cut off the water. And then for three years, God put Elijah, here he goes to school, out there inside. Folks, God does some 
strange things to us. I mean, about the time that we think that we are about ready to do something, for the Lord God will put us in a situation that's absolutely scary. And we wonder why are we in this situation? God, why did you put me here? God, why am I like this? God, why? 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 I had a fellow call me last night, and he said, Brother Roger, is it all right to ask God why? Is it all right? I said, yes. Because God knows our infirmities. And he knows our ups and our downs and our ends and all of our eyes. And when we come to the place to where we don't know what to do or where to go, we say, God, why? Why me? Why this or why that? Well, in the school that Elijah went to, you learn to answer that question. Because Elijah learned that strength came through testing. And let me just say to you this morning that if you've not been in the school of testing, get ready. Amen. You will be before too long. It may be in the area of your physical body, in your marriage, in your finances, with your children. It may be that, that you've got kids that are already grown and away from home, but they're still driving you crazy. It may be a time of testing in your life. Why? God put Elijah out there in that desert by brook. He didn't put him by a river. He put him by a brook. And I can imagine in my mind just a little drizzle of water every once in a while would come back. You say, Brother Roger, why didn't he put him by a river? Well, if he'd have put him by a river, he wouldn't have needed God. Right. And so he stayed by this little brook. And God gave him just enough water to survive. What was he doing? He was training him. He was training him. And then you know that God sent ravens to feed. Now that's, that's amazing to me. That God would send ravens. And you know what he did? He sent just enough to life one day. Now I want you to get this. Because you may never hear me preaching again. When God's training us, teaching us, testing us, he does it in this type of way. I'm going to tell you, every day when those ravens came in to old Elijah, sitting there by that little stream of water, I believe that God was saying to Elijah, Son, I'll meet all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Elijah, I promise you that I'm going to take care of you. Listen, don't ever trust in other resources what you got in the bank, what you got hid at the house and the job. I heard. Never trust in that. Trust God. Amen. And He'll send you through. Amen. He can bring you. And so God just kept old Elijah going one day at a time. I was trying to remember that song over there when I was playing. Now, I don't remember all of it, but I remember some of it. I remember it starts off, God, I'm only human. And we don't understand a lot of times why things happen. But I'm going to tell you, God can lead 
your source. God can be your source. You may not have anything in the bank. You may not have anything hid. You may not have anything. But if you're trusting God and God is supplying your need, you ought to shout all over Sand Mountain because God is teaching you something. Amen. Elijah stayed out there three years. He learned to trust God. He seen a dead boy, a dead boy raised back to life. He seen a winter woman. A barrel, meal barrel filled many times. God was teaching Elijah some things that we needed today. Amen. God is our source. Number two, success comes through patience. And I told them. Wednesday night, this is not my good point. I'm not a patient person. In fact, when we get ready to go somewhere, I say, Betty, you ready? No. I say, Betty, are you ready? No. Well, when are you going to get ready? Well, just give me a few more minutes. I say, hurry, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm ready to eat. Let's go. Okay. So I'll shut up in the chair. And I just go to camp and I'll camp and see how long it's going to take. She don't get in a hurry. She don't get and I'm very impatient. She is. She can she can say. In one chair, in one position, I believe for a week. <laughs> and she don't get excited. She don't get upset. She don't, she don't marry like I do. Well, she's going to live longer than I am today. <laughs> but I'm impatient. Did you know? That one of the things we have to learn in God's school is that we've got to be patient. How many of you have prayed for somebody in your home or somebody in your family? How many of you prayed that they'd get saved? How long has it been since you prayed? Long time. But I want to tell you something. When your prayer is not answered, keep praying. Just keep a praying. Some of you may be here this morning. And, and you're going through a time and you're having a problem and you're saying, God, give me patience. Give me patience. I'm telling you, God will. Because strength comes through testing. Success comes through patience. And folks, I'm telling you, Elijah was thankful over the little things as far as refilling a meal barrel, he was thankful to raise up that little boy from the dead. He was thankful to just sit out there by that little brook and let God take him. Amen. You say, well, preacher, what kind of lesson can we learn from that? God wants you to be faithful in the little thing. And if you'll be faithful with the little thing, God will bless you with the big thing. Now let me hurt, because this other point was what the kids were wanting to hear. 
Success comes through patience, strength through testing, and spirituality comes through obedience. People say to me, preacher, how can I be spiritual? I've had young people come up to me and say, preacher, how can I be spiritual? And I've noticed everybody wants to be spiritual. I believe as a true child of God, there probably comes a moment in your life when you ask yourself, tell yourself or ask yourself, Lord, I want to be spiritual. Let me tell you something and write this down, young people. The strange thing about being spiritual, and I've, all, I've heard this all my life, Oh, Brother Roger, they are spiritual. They are spiritual. Oh, they're, they're spiritual. But folks, the strange thing, listen, about being spiritual is when you think you are, you ain't. When you think you are, you ain't. If you're spiritual... You, you can't, you, you, don't, you don't even know if you are. Because if you're spiritual, you're seeking God. You're living in His presence. And you just never feel like you've arrived. Folks, the crowd that thinks they've arrived, look at me. They are. You say, preacher, do they go past it? No, they just have a blowout on the road to where they are supposed to be going, and they're stuck in a ditch. You're here today, and you've got all the answers. Our young people, I many of them, they've got all the answers and the questions. And I thought I did when I was your age. I thought I had all plus the question. And I figured out I didn't know that. You, you've got all the answers, kids. You may think you have. And everybody else in the world needs to be right with God. And you're holy. You're right with God. You're, you're super spiritual. You're a saint of God. Folks, I'm telling you that when you have all of the answers, now listen, to all of the questions, and you look, listen, and you lose that sense of joy and awe that you're a sinner, saved by grace, and you only stand, listen, in the presence of God because of His mercy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I want you to understand something, folks. You're not spiritual if you've got that kind of attitude. Spiritual people don't know they are spiritual. In fact, the closer you get to God, sometimes the more unspiritual you think. Are you listening? Amen. Man, it's a holy place. Look at Isaiah, for example. And I'm rushing. The Bible said that he is in the temple. And he seen the Lord high and lifted up. And you talk about a spiritual man. He seen the Lord high and lifted up. And the Bible said God's train filled the temple. And the place is rocking and a shaking with the earthquake of God's glory. Smoke filled that place. And smoke is a sign of God's glory. The angels are flying around singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yes. What does the 
was out there today. I can just see some Baptist men here trying to get up there with the, with the angels. But not I tell you, you know what he did? He fell down on the ground. Listen. And he said, I'm unworthy.
Folks, that is, listen, that is, that is full and true spirituality. It's not how high you jump on Sunday or on Monday, but it's how much you trust God on Monday, <coughs> Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That's spirituality. When God says, go, you need to move. Amen. Do you obey God? You've got to be trained. disturbing the peace. I'm not talking about going out here with bad breath and bloodshot eyes and say, hey boys, you're going to hell if you don't straighten up. There's a certain amount of spiritual tact sometimes that we need to use. We never need to refrain from talking about God and we never need to fear the fact that somebody But we don't need to go out there. Are you listening? And offend people just for the sake of the family. Look at Obadiah. He's that life fellow that he read about. Really, Obadiah was a secret disciple. Had a great deal. He had already hid and how many prophets in the cave that had been. <coughs> I think the greatest lesson that young people could learn right now, and I hear some of you right now, you go home, sit down at the table, well, Brother Roger didn't preach like you. Praise the Lord. Brother Brian, you didn't he didn't act like you said. I know. I've been sick for about four weeks and tried to get over it. Praise the Lord. You need to pray. Amen. Yeah, hey, brother Roger, he was just too old. tell you this morning that when I give it up <laughs> you better go over to one of the funeral homes and buy me a casket because it'll be time to lay me down. You, Lord. you say why? Because I ain't giving up. Amen. I may have to take hold of the devil's foot with one hand and drag him to hell screaming and hollering. But I'm going to get the last lick in. One day or the other. Because it's been too good to me. Be a disturber. Now, somebody has went to sleep on me. That's okay. In about two or three months, you'll call me and you'll say, Brother Roger, what do you say about so and in that service? And I'm going to say, I ain't going to take it. You ought to be in a list. Amen. You ought to be in a list. Thank you. 